Rebel Force Radio presents Star Wars, Star Wars Cantina. Where are you going, Master? For a drink. Sorry about the mess. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. <laughs> We've received emails from listeners about the Star Wars films, but we've never received an email from someone who was actually in one of the Star Wars films asking us a question. Yeah, this is a real surprise. This showed up in our inbox. Gentlemen, as one of the actors who dubbed characters, Vanden Willard and others in the original Star Wars, I am curious as to what Other American actors dubbed the film as well. I worked alone with Lucas, but I know there was a Walla group that voiced other characters in crowds. Would you have the names of who they were? I can't recall the ADR coordinator of the group, but I think it was Barbara Harris. I could be wrong. However, unlike most films today, the dubbers weren't listed, as I recall. Thanks, Michael Bell. Michael Bell. So this name didn't ring a bell, but I know his character. No pun intended. But I know his character, General Willard. From the uh, the scene on Yavin Base, when Princess Leia arrives with the Rebels, and they're riding on a transport, they get pulled into the X-Wing hangar, and Leia jumps off, and immediately an older gentleman approaches her and says... You're safe. When we heard about Alderaan, we feared the worst. That is General Willard. And it was played by an actor named Eddie Burns. Eddie Byrne died in 1981, but the voice was dubbed over. And this is a common practice in Hollywood. It's called ADR, additional dialogue recording, is one of the ways you can, uh, (laughs) I think ADR stands for a number of things, but additional dialogue recording Mm -hmm. is uh, something they do to add in additional voices after the film has been shot. Sometimes dialogue gets completely replaced. Right. Uh, other times it is just for background voices. Our good friend James Arnold Taylor has uh, done a lot of this in his career for uh, many of the different uh, actors that he uh, mimics so well. Right, right. So he's asking questions, Michael is, about how he can find out who else was involved in ADR for A New Hope. Can I have a little fanboy moment here? Sure. I got to have a fanboy moment because when I saw this come through... I thought, gosh, that name really sounds familiar. And uh, it, but it was invest. It was directed towards Jimmy, so I didn't really, I really didn't pay it much mind. And then Jimmy and I were talking on the phone, and he started kind of bringing this up, and I'm like, Michael Bell, Michael Bell. And then I realized, Michael Bell, the Michael Bell, one of the most iconic voices in all animation. Michael Bell, best known for playing Duke in the original G.I. Joe series, also a regular on the Smurfs, Super Friends, all of those iconic cartoons from the late 70s and early 80s. I mean, Michael Bell, when you hear the voice, there's no mistaking it. And so I'm freaking out a little bit that Michael Bell knows who we are. (laughs) Duke from G.I. Joe knows who we are. Joining us now on the phone is none other than... The voice of General Willard in A New Hope, Michael Bell. Michael. Yeah. Uh, Michael, this is my co-host, Jason Swank. Hi, Michael. Hey, Jason. How you doing? Great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Are you sure that's not you, Jim, with another voice? Because you sound alike. <laughs> Do we? See, nobody's ever said that we sound alike. But, but Michael, you're a guy who's really in touch with the sound of people's voices, seeing that you're a voice actor who's done a lot of amazing things. We were talking about your career before we got you on the line and um, your, your contributions to Star Wars A New Hope. Put that aside. There's a lot of iconic voices, a lot of iconic cartoon characters, especially that you've voiced over the years. I'm particularly impressed with the fact that I'm talking to Zan from the Wonder Twins from Super Friends. We've got to stay awake, Jaina. Wonder Twin Powers Activate Shape of Octopus Form of an Ice Unicycle Come on, Jaina It's up to us to stop those aliens Okay <laughs> And uh, I know my uh, my cohort Jason is uh, really excited to be talking to Duke from G.I. Joe Oh yeah, my gosh we, you know, we, we all inhabit we all inhabit, we inhabit the same uvula <laughs> Well, you know, the way I look at it is the Transformers fans, they've got their Peter Cullen. 
But G.I. Joe fans, we've got our Michael Bell. That's it. That's it. I told Peter to come on that, and uh, he started to cry. I had to back off. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you, you you gave us a challenge here on the Forcecast. You uh, yeah, yeah. You, you reached out to us. How did you hear about the Forcecast, by the way? Somebody else had said to me, uh, I had sent something out on my Facebook to my fans that uh, this is just sort of a oh, it's almost like a Nicholas Cage quest to 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 find the source, as it were, of um, the uh, the original contract for uh, for Star Wars, which I have misread or lost. And several other people who did uh, voice work on it lost or cannot find since so many years had passed. And uh, it became a quest, and so I, I, I posed it out to my uh, Facebook fans, and eventually people began to email me, call these people, contact these people, go to this website, and someone said, go to your website, and I did, and I contacted you. Well, fantastic. So there we go. Uh, our uh, loyal listening audience is uh, out sure. there looking for, uh, looking out for various talent involved with the original Star Wars. And you're one of them, Michael. I, you know, I'm a little embarrassed, too, because I wrote back Michael. I was like, uh, how about coming on the show? We could talk about your uh, newfound fame with uh, Star Wars. Because you, you told me it wasn't until just recently people started making the connection with you and Star Wars. Well, I've been getting, I've been getting emails for a couple... I'm getting um, uh, fan mail for a couple of years now. But I just... I just, you know, because I get a lot of fan mail for uh, for the different animated voices that I had done. And then people began to send me photos of uh, um, uh, Van and Willard, and I said, how would you know I did that? I mean, I knew I did that, because <laughs> I remember the day I did it. I remember all the elements surrounding it, you know, going through this with George and, you know, how are we going to do this, and blah, 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 and whether it fit, and so forth and so on, and my reflections, my reactions to the uh, rushes that I saw before anybody else saw the, uh, the finished product. And um, I couldn't imagine that anybody knew that. In fact, the uh, as I recall, and I haven't seen the film since it first came out, I, I don't recall there were any credits with my name attached to it. Normally, nowadays, they have ADR or dubbing, and they said additional voices supplied by. But in those days, I think it was 75 or 74 that we did it, prior to its coming out in 76, I think it was, um, I had no idea that anybody knew. And then, and I never posted it. I never said I did it. And just all of a sudden, I began to get all this, these requests for photographs and whatever. Not my photograph. They wanted me to sign the uh, Van and Willard photograph. And I said, sure. So, uh, and I, then only recently did I get curious about, uh, well, gee, I never got a residual for that. So, <laughs> what if, you, you say you remember it really well. Um, can yeah. you kind of uh, tell us what, what the strongest memories are of, the, of that particular session? And, and did you work directly with George? Like you did say you worked alone with him in your, uh, in your email to us. Yeah, I don't recall the studio I went to. It might have been Warner's Arts or it might have been 20th. I'm not sure. I, at that time in my career, I was in the 70s, I was, um, I was so hot it was almost impossible for me to get lunch. I, I was working several sessions a day, five days a week. It was just, uh, it was like a floodgate had opened up uh, on my voice. So um, my agent at that time with the CESD had said to me, uh, we have a session with you with um, with uh, George Lucas for his new film, uh, Star Wars, and he wants you to dub something. And I said, okay. And the name wasn't recognizable to me. I, I, you know, I didn't really pay attention to those things. I don't know where this is. For this, I remember it from American Graffiti, or um, I think his first sci-fi film um, with Duval. I think it was THX 1138. That's what it was, THX. So, and I said, well, okay. And I, 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 I never had stars in my eyes unless it was a movie star. I didn't have stars in my eyes for directors or producers. I just wasn't of that ilk. I mean, nowadays it would be different, but then I just I went and did my job and, and left. Um, Unless it was a movie star involved, of course, I was a movie kid. I was raised in, you know, and, and I went into the, I went to the movie so much as a kid that it was movie stars that made a difference. And I never looked to see who the directors were. So when I walked in, George introduced himself and the engineer, and he said, "I want to show you something." And he showed me the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, the dailies. And I looked at it and I thought, "Oh God, what am I looking at here? There's this kid and this other actor, and they're dueling with flashlights." <laughs> I mean, how goofy is that? And of course, none of these special effects were 
superimposed at that point. And then Alec Guinness was nice. Oh, you get Alec Guinness? He said, yeah. I said, well, that's great. And, uh, and I, I thought, I didn't know who this kid was. And I thought, well, they got a surfer because I, I didn't think much of him. And then I had never seen Harrison Ford before. And I said, what the heck is that? He's just over the top. And I went, ooh, God. And then, uh, then I saw the, uh, and this is really rude of me, but you know, I'm, I'm going, going by my personal reflection at the time. And then, uh, then I saw the scene with um, this older guy talking to this princess, and I went, "Whoa, who is that? Where'd you get her? Yeah, <laughs> she's not very pretty, is she? For uh, my idea of a princess is not that. She's got a big head. Who is that? And he was very nice. He said, "That's Carrie Fisher." I said, "Oh, okay. I don't know who that is. It's your, it's, it's uh, Fisher's wife." I went, uh, "Fisher's daughter." I went, "Oh, oh, are you Fisher's? Okay, who's the kid?" He said, it's, uh, "Mark." Uh, and I went, okay, and we go. not that it's any of my business, but you know, this is chat that you have during a session. <laughs> and then uh, he said to me, so I think that I said, I guess my opinion. I said, mm, I don't know. I said, I'm a big sci-fi fan. I said, yeah. He said, look, it's not an acting picture. It's an action picture. I remember him telling this to me. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, fine. So he said, this is what I want you to do. Look at this scene. And I looked at this scene of these guys at a round table. And he said, this guy's Darth Vader. He walks in, and they had this boy stubbed in, and then this guy's in this one guy. He, he suddenly says something to Vader, and, he, and Vader gets angry, and the guy begins to grab his throat and starts to choke. And he, and he chokes him, I guess. He chokes him to death, because I don't remember seeing him. And then, he, and then I said, uh, and he said, I want you to do his voice. I want you to dub them. I said, okay. So I dubbed them. And then he said, and he, he played it back. And I said, can I see the original one again? He said, sure, he plays the original. I went, why do you want to dub him? And he said, well, because he's English. And I said, yeah, but they're all English. Well, why did you want to dub him? He's really good. And he said, you think so? I said, yes, he's doing a very good job. I'll dub whatever you want me to dub, George, but he's doing a really good job. And I would hate him to see the film and go, that's not my voice, just because you wanted an American. So he played me back in his voice, you know, my voice in his face again. He said, well, I like that. And I said, man, listen, it's your film. I'm just telling you, my opinion, it doesn't mean but I just think he's really good. <laughs> but he said, okay, all right, I'll take your word for it. So that was it. And I said, okay, great. And then he went out to the next one, and then it was this older guy talking to uh, uh, Princess Celia, and I said, okay, I'll, he's okay, but I'll dub him if you want. And I dubbed him, and he played it back. He said, yeah, we like that. We really like that. And I said, okay, good, so you got it. Then there's all these scenes, action scenes with guys in, in their in their in their planes and their, their ships and they're shooting and they're screaming and they're yelling and, and it's in red and and it's, he said that's the uh, that's the uh, fleet and I went oh, okay and he said I'm dying left and right there's all these different voices I'm doing this southern voice and a different voice and then a deep back voice and another voice over here and another voice over here you know I got him I got him inside of ah, all that <laughs> and, and I finished my you know and that was it and at the end of it and he said okay so you know what you Think and I said, well, yeah, I don't know. I'm, it's a day's work for me. And I, and I saw my thing, got my fee, and, and uh, went home. Then about, I think it was a year later, was it? Maybe six months, eight months later, I'm out with some friends. And they said, oh, man, we're going to go to Grandma's Chinese. We're going to see Star Wars. I said, no, no, you count me out. I'm, I'm not interested. I said, why? I said, I did voices. And said, oh, man, you did voices? And I said, yeah, I'm not going to go see that turkey. You got any mind? I don't know if I, you know. Oh, I'll stay home. They said, oh, come on, man, let's go, come on. And everybody talked me into it, and I went to Grauman's, and I stood on line, and we went inside, and from the time the movie started to the end of the film, I was absolutely swept away like everybody else. Oh, I was absolutely brought into it, swept away, and finally, you know, we all went out for dinner, we all sat there, talked about how excited, and finally one of the guys turned and said, so what voice did you know? I said, I have no idea. I can't remember. I was so swept up in the film. I don't... I don't who looked? Who listened? I mean, normally I would go, oh, that's me. Oh, yeah, that's my... You know, because... But I absolutely got so swept up in, in the film that I had totally neglected to re remember to poke them and say, hey, that's my voice. <laughs> well, you said you were a big sci-fi fan going into it. Yeah, but that was... When I saw The Rushes, I thought, ooh. I mean, this really looked like and, you know, when you see rushes, you see dailies, you can't really judge by that because it's black and white and it's and it's uh, caca and, and there's not a lot of filler and they haven't done all the post work on it. 
uh, it's just, it's really raw. And I was judging it by that, which was, you know, dumb, stupid, naive me, green as I was, you know, voice actor, you know, whatever, it made no difference. I just did not see it. I didn't have that vision when I saw it, and I only saw certain scenes that I was, you know, they voiced it. But, you know, I saw, it looked silly to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then that flashlights, there was no, there was no <laughs> beam or anything like that. It was just these guys <laughs> with flashlights. Mm-hmm. And uh, then at the, the, when I saw the film, it was just, I mean, I was, I was swept away with everybody else. Anyway. It was, ooh, ah. And I thought, God, how great that is. And that was way before DVD. It was during, I think, the VH, VHS, or the people still doing uh, VHS. And so I, you know, I thought nothing about it at all. And, uh, and that was the end of it. And that, and that was, you know, some total of my involvement, as it were. I've since got to know uh, Mark uh, pretty well. And he said, we're not close friends or anything, but we have the same agency. And we'd worked together, I think, on Nina and the Count, which is an animated show for Hannah Barbera. He was the Count. And we've seen each other in sessions and talked and waved and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, then, that, then that film um, took off. Um, what is it? I mean, I think it was about 13 years later, and I tossed, you know, after 10 years of talks all your contracts, you can't keep all that stuff. And then it occurred to me, about 13, 14 years later, I said, I never got a residual. Mm-hmm. I never got, and I knew residuals came into being in 71, I did this in about 74, 75, and I said, I never got a residual. So I called the agency, and they said, okay, let's, uh, yeah, you're right. And I said, you know, why didn't somebody remind me? Why didn't somebody say something? It never occurred to anybody. I said, well, this movie is selling hotcakes. VHS, you can't keep the VHS up in the, you know, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, on the, on the, on the shelves. Right. And then, of course, DVDs came in, and it, it just went wild. And and um, the, the Friday DVDs was the was the big one, the big record, the big gigantic uh, disc. And then uh, then DVDs came in, and it just went wild and streaming. And so I started a search. Mm-hmm. So we sent a letter to them. To the uh, to Lucas a little bit nice and uh, by the way I've worked for Lucas since I don't think anybody makes a connection so I sent a, um, a letter saying we would you know would appreciate you uh, sending the and they said let's see your contract you're not on that kind of contract I said but I am and he said you're not let me see your contract well they didn't have my contract I said well you have the contract I know you got a record of it and they said no let me see yours we'll show you mine <laughs> and I did not have the uh, you know the the business sense to at that point immediately contact an attorney and then you know pay for the bucks to get them to court. Right. So I never did. And then I've since been in, I was in contact with John Hofstetter today, who did the, one of the major voices in um, uh, Return of the Jedi. Okay. He was a major character in that. We talked. He doesn't have a contract. And then I called Clive Revel. Uh, yes, I spoke with him. He's an English buddy of mine, and he did the voice of the Emperor. Yes. In, uh, Mm-hmm. Um, Empire Strikes Back. And he says, I tell you, Street, I don't have a clue. I have no idea. And I said, Don't you have a contract? I, who knew this? This is 70 years ago. I said, Didn't you keep your contract, you schmuck? And he said, No, did you keep yours? I said, No, I'm a schmuck. Well, why should you be a schmuck if I'm a schmuck? Why did you keep your contract? He said, I want to see what it looks like. So uh, I'm still been searching to find out who did the ADR in it, which is uh, additional dialogue. Uh, Automated, automatic dialogue replacement, uh, which the, the Walla groups and the, in the, in the dubbing groups, and I wanted to know who kept their contracts. I'm just curious to see it at this point. Right now, but he said, you know, that you know, it's not even non, it's not even a union film, which I didn't know. By the way, Jim, before you tell Michael uh, the results of your investigation, I just want to point out to our listeners the the Imperial officer who Michael single handedly saved his career is one Richard Leparmentier. Admiral Mahdi in that scene. So I, if, if, if you, you folks out there listening, uh, next time you see uh, Richard, you let him know that Michael Bell's voice, or excuse me, Richard's voice is only in that film because Michael Bell said to George Lucas, you keep that man's voice in the film. Oh, is that who it was? Oh, my God. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I thought he was super. And, you know, and as much as, and now, of course. He thinks, think he's, he thinks he's fantastic as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, Papa's Pets, huh? Okay. <laughs> well, when I said to, I said to Lucas, and I said, why is, is everybody English? He said, I did this in England. I said, so what are you complaining about that everybody's English? <laughs> you going to start replacing them with American voices? He was kind of, 
chagrined. We went, well, you know, I want some more Americans in there. I said, but you should have hired Americans. I never thought politically. I never thought SAG. I never thought uh, anything other than, okay, fine. You know, I think, you know, Guinness is great. I didn't know reading the stuff that I think you guys have on your website or some other people's website that Guinness was unhappy and said, get me out of this. And, I mean, I had no idea any of that was taking place. I didn't have a clue. And wow. since then, of course, I've seen uh, Carrie Fish, Fisher's show, and she talks about her time in the film and how it made her famous. But the point is that years later, you know, I now find out that what happened was that, you know how the film starts with just the ship coming into view and, and the credits take place at the end of the film? That's the yes. first time that ever happened. Right, right. As a matter of fact, I believe right. George got fined by the, uh, by, uh, the, the director's Union guild for... Yeah. The Screenwriters Guild, and he quit. Yeah, yeah. He walked out of the Screenwriters Guild and said, I'll take it to England, screw you all, and he did. <laughs> and, and, he, and he got, I mean, he got, he got uh, I think, I, don't, I can't speak out of turn, but from what I know, he got Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford and, and, um, and Carrie Fisher for, like, for something like two Fig Newtons and a chicken. I mean, <laughs> they hardly got him to pay for that. And I think he flew them coach. He was such an El Chico, but he probably didn't have money at the time. You know, he probably wasn't Lucas at the time, the Lucas at the time. And so he flew them coach. You couldn't fly coach. Any actor in a starring in a film, especially at that distance, always had to go first class according to screen actors. I get the impression I get the impression that most of the principles now, since the uh since the, the other films were made, I think that I don't think most of them complain. I think they've been pretty well taken care of. Maybe not that oh, first one. Yeah. Are you kidding? Oh my god, they got <laughs> merchandise, I think, on the second one. <laughs> Plus great fees, because the first one was such a hit. They weren't gonna go back in saying, Oh yeah, the guy could do it again in your garage, George. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they said, Yeah, whoa, but this is what it's gonna cost you by that time. You know, he made his billions, and he, he probably said, mm, no problem. I think Mark did very, very well. I know Harrison did well, and I think uh, Carrie, Carrie Fisher did very well. Anybody else in the films after the fact did very well. They got merchandise for their for their uh, their uh, um, action toys and everything. I mean, everybody got really chunks, got pieces. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was the first film that didn't that everybody did for nothing. Right, right, right. Well, but it, it did eventually pay off, but but not for you. You're still waiting for those residuals. Well, it's not going to happen. You know, I, I'm I'm fully cognizant of the fact that I'm not going to find anybody that has kept their contract. If they didn't go after it now, I'd be the only person I would imagine that that might have. I don't know if she got any, an extra deal with Barbara Harris, who has the ADR group that did the wallop for the second film. I, I didn't notice if she did that wallop for the first film, the ADR for the first film. She did the wallop group or not. But um, she must have done okay um, with it. I don't know if she got residuals because she obviously has to, you know, ADR, the ADR people uh, who are the um, coordinators also do voices, so they're listed as actors and actresses. Mm-hmm. So they also do voices. So she may have made a deal. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have a clue. And she's not going to tell us. She's <laughs> not going to take that on. I wouldn't take on Lucas either under those circumstances. But now that I'm I'm no longer doing that stuff. I can take him on, but I don't have a contract to prove the fact that uh, I worked under a screen actor's deal contract, even though the film wasn't SAG. Well, you know, it's it's kind of funny how this is all coming around because you reached out to Lucasfilm and uh, they wanted to see your contract, and I reached out to Lucasfilm. Really? I yeah, I I have, a, I have some friends over there. And um, I asked them if there was any uh, chance they might have some records of those who performed in the ADR group or the Walla group or whatever you want to call it. And uh, so I got a hold of them and uh, we checked in the uh, Lucasfilm archives and uh, the archivist wasn't able to come up with any of the names we're looking for. Uh, (laughs) He suspects they may have been documented in the contract signed with the studios back then. But well, it's anyone's it guess. Signatory. They thought it might have been a signatory since he wasn't SAG that he might have gotten. And that's what they often do. You know, they'll get a signatory mm-hmm. um, to take the place of. Well, the signatory is imposed, as is the producer, even though it's not the producer who himself has signed the actor. And the signatory has, uh, the signatory has, he's still hired by the producer. So the signatory is responsible and open to pay those. And they'll say, no, 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 I, I, only, I was only the you know, secondary. I was just brought in. I'm, I'm just sort of the rented donkey. That's not good enough. And, you know, we've gone after people like that. And in final analysis, they, they've had to go back to the producer, uh, like Sony or somebody like that, because and, and, uh, I've done games like that. 
where you've done a signatory and then, and then you're not getting, you didn't get your money or whatever it was. And then you go right back to selling and you say, you owe me. <clears throat> they say, no, I had a signatory. And I said, oh, well, no, you're a damn. It, it says a Sony game. And then, you know, you get what you want. You, you, know, you put up a fight, but it's a long, grueling fight. And if you're young and you've got a career ahead of you, you don't want to take those people on. Hmm. Me, I was just busy. Yeah, right. right. I would have taken them on had I known. Uh, had I known it was going where it was going. But uh, so be it. You know, it's just that's one of those famous tales. I mean, I look back and go, Mm, I could use that eight hundred and fifty or nine hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> oh. That would really be nice to have. <laughs> Who wouldn't mind that showing up in the mailbox one day? But Boy, wouldn't oh. that be nice? So, so no go with Lucasfilm. So I decided to uh, dig a little deeper, and I checked yeah. with I checked with uh, the premier autograph collector when it comes to Star Wars, a guy named uh, Mark Dermel from Belgium. So yeah. I asked him. Mark, you collect all the autographs. What do you know about people who did voice work on A New Hope? And the first name he came back to me with, Michael Bell. <laughs> so he came back to me with that. But he had additional names. He also gave me David Ankrum, who was the voice of Red 2 Wedge. Look at the size of that thing. That was David. And that's from A New Hope. And then another name that you might know, Terry McGovern. Who was sure, I know Terry very well. And he also did some background voices in THX 1138. Terry is the guy who coined the word Wookiee and introduced that word to George Lucas. And you can oh. actually hear that in the background radio chatter in the film THX 1138. And I'm sure, I'm sure George was so thrilled and, and so glad that he, he must be sending Terry checks. He must have given him a huge check for that. Oh, yeah. He, he got your 800000 <laughs> That's what happened. That was just, I, say, I got to call Terry and tell him. He's in San Francisco now, I think. I got to call him and tell him I want my money. Yeah, or at least he can buy you a drink or something. I mean. Oh, it's something. You know, just buy me, buy me the bar. <laughs> you can afford it. And so, so we got a couple from the autograph guy. Now, I, I finally reached out to Star Wars artist Leah Mang. She used to have a great website called the Star Wars Actors Database. It included every known actor to perform in a Star Wars movie, TV show, or video game. Credited, uncredited, Hollywood superstar to background extra. They were all in her. She researched everything. Total comprehensive research. But unfortunately, her website is gone. It will be incorporated into her blog in the future. But she was kind enough to let me comb through her archives of thousands and thousands of entries. And I found the following names. I found these names that were involved in... Uh, with ADR for A New Hope. So um, a lot of people with Cantina Walla, background sounds you hear in the Cantina. One guy is a filmmaker from American Zotrope, Todd Bodelheide. You know Todd? Todd Bodelheide. Yeah. We have a couple Lucasfilm staffers, Bunny Alsip and Lucy Autry-Wilson. Um, we have... Uh, a guy named John Sila. Does that name sound familiar? No, John Sila. No, it doesn't. John Sila performed Stormtrooper voices as well as Cantina Walla. And his brother was another Lucasfilm staffer named Tom Sila. And he performed Stormtrooper voices as well as an intercom voice in the Rebel base on Yavin. Oh, no. Nope. Oh, all right. Well, doesn't... I have the name of a few Stormtrooper voices for you, too. Okay, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, you know, Terry McGovern's a good lead. I, I would love to talk to Terry, but I doubt very seriously whether he, um, she's even more than I did. So. All right, we have a few guys here, and I'm afraid some of these guys may have passed away. Actor Morgan. I'll still find him. I'm not guessing, <laughs> I'll find you'll, him. You'll dig him up somehow, right? I'm going to dig him up or whatever it takes. Yeah, go ahead. Well, you have actor Morgan Upton, who also performed alongside Mark Hamill in a small role in Corvette Summer. Uh, Jerry Walter, who is an actor from Chicago. And the Internet Movie Database credits Scott Beach as a performing Stormtrooper voice. Scott Beach, I may know. That's possible. I'll check that out. Is that two T's or one T? Uh, Scott Beach, two T's. Um, uh, he may have passed away. Well, damn him for crying out loud. <laughs> okay. Um, Rick Victor. 
was a 20th Century Fox employee, and he performed some Jawa voices. I think Rick was a projectionist over there at the uh, Fox Studios. Okay, that's where I think I recorded. Um, that's where I think I recorded. Through my research, I also looked at the making of Star Wars book by J.W. Rinsler, and there is a picture of a folder that says Star Wars Real One Foley Q Sheets. Um, the name Sam Shaw is on the folder. I don't know if that name's familiar to you, Sam Shaw. And it's dated 3777 Warner's Stage Number 5. Now, it wouldn't be for me for 77 because the film came out when? 76, didn't it? It came out in 77 that summer. So this would be a few months prior to its release. Ah, Warner Stage what? Number five. Number five. Right. That may be it. Uh, Maybe. Well, somebody said, I know that uh, um, John Hofstetter said he thinks he did his at Warner's. Mm -hmm. He doesn't remember. He thinks he did the uh, Return of the Jedi at Warner's. Well, that's possible. I mean, at least the Foley stuff was recorded there. Uh, yeah. But I would imagine things like Background Walla, et cetera, was also recorded at Warner's. But I don't have any uh, proof of that. I also uh, see the voice of Greedo was done by a guy named Larry Ward, who was an expert linguist brought in by Ben Burt. And Larry went on to voice the character of Jabba the Hutt in Return of the Jedi. I see. Okay. And I think Larry has also passed away. As for Barbara Harris's involvement. Um, yeah. Internet Movie Database shows no credits for Barbara Harris or Barbara Harris casting prior to 1982. But that her is age- so bizarre. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I do know her agency. But then 82, 82 is Jedi, I think. When did Jedi come out? 83. All right. So then that's when she probably did, because I think um, John said he remembers doing Jedi somewhere in the, in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm definitely. He, he said he was so excited because he had had, a, had an action figure or something. <laughs> Her agency definitely specializes in providing ADR and looping for hundreds of Hollywood productions. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know who did the ADR for the first film. Right, and I I've yet to find. I was brought in by myself. I've yet to find the connection between her company and Star Wars, but I got news for you. I did find her phone number. So I gave her a call, left her a message, and have yet to hear back. <laughs> I don't think you will. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I will either. I think uh, a lot of people uh, are looking for her phone number because uh, I know yeah, that I, a lot of people are looking for work. So, Yeah, I don't think you will. I don't think she's going to call you back. I'd be surprised if she did. If you ask her if she did, I'm sure she didn't do the ADR on Star Wars. But if you ask her, I know she did the ADR on uh, The Turn of the Jedi because John Huff said it was part of that group. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'd be curious to know whether, uh, whether under what contract that was done. Was that under a SAG contract? Or was there a signatory? Because I can't imagine that Lucas would have chosen a, a different signatory for each film. He probably, I would seem to me, he'd keep the same signatory because he would trust that signatory to handle it. I could be wrong. But uh, again, you know, this to me is kind of like, this is like a, an interesting puzzle. Yep. You know, I, I, don't, I don't see stars, I don't see any dollar bills in front of me at all because their attitude was, hey, you come up with a contract and we'll show you ours. And I, you know, it's, uh, to me it would have, to me, it would have been nice if they said, well, wait a second, Mike, let me take a look. No, you, you were a one-day player, and there's no stipulation for uh, a rescission. But obviously, they got something to hide if they're being that cagey. So, uh, uh, but again, I would have had to get an attorney and go after it, and then they got to do it in discovery. And I was just too busy to play with it. And also, it didn't seem like a great deal for me at the time. But of course, as I look back now, wow. You know <laughs> wow is right. Well, what can I say? You know, I thought, listen, um, I, I never got any residuals uh, until recently that I recall for uh, the, what is it, Kiss the Phantom, whatever the hell it was. Oh, uh, Kiss the Meets Phantom. the Phantom. Um, which which uh, uh, guy from Kiss did you voice? Was it Peter Chris or someone? Peter, Peter Chris. Yeah, it was Peter Chris. Chris. That that movie, wow. Kiss That's... Meets Fan- the Phantom of the Park, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes. Phantom of the Park or something like that, yeah. It, but again, I was, I was brought in. I didn't know who Kiss was, and... I watched all these guys, and you know, I was pretty—I was just a really straight-laced kid from Brooklyn. And I didn't know from all that crap, and I just did his voice because they said his voice was a little light, a little sibilant. So they brought me in, they did it, and who knew it would be such an underground hit and, and have such a fan base as a result of doing Peter Chris's voice? 
I'm sure Peter Chris is thrilled. One of these days I'll meet him and say, hey, I did your voice. And he'll, <laughs> <laughs> so you're the guy. <laughs> uh, you're the guy. <laughs> Well, that's great. I mean, you, you certainly have, have had a lot of work over the years. And, and, uh, and I know Jason's interested in certain part of uh, bits and pieces of your career. Like, uh, like I mentioned, uh, the G.I. Joe. Um, again, as I said, I know you best is uh, Zan from the Super Friends. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, I just had lunch the other day with Louise Williams, who was Jane. And we just got together after all those years. In fact, I told her it was very funny because I was at Hannibal Bear when it closed. Because they did so much of my work at Hannibal Bear, and they and they called me and they said we're doing a commercial here, and it features Zan and uh, Jane, and we can't find Louise Williams. We brought another young woman in. I said okay, fine. So I went in, and I did this commercial. And I I don't know what it was. It was it was a form of snot or something. I don't know what the hell it was. I was always water, and uh, always so I did it, and we finished it. Uh, and uh, she go form of a bucket, and I go form of water or whatever. Form of an eagle, form of a eagle sweat or something and then uh, I went in and he did it and then after we finished went okay that's the last recording here at HB I went what What?" he said you just closed the place I said I closed the place he said yeah it's the last recording we're not doing anymore it's now being closed we've been putting everything up and it goes to Warner's I went whoa so I called up Frank Welker and he said hey Frank I closed at my bear (laughs) (laughs) Oh wow, Fr- Frank crazy. Welker, of course, the uh, the voice of pr- best known probably for Fred and uh, Scooby Doo, and oh, yeah. um, and a million well, others. Scooby Doo, that was that was uh, uh, that was oh golly, what the hell was his name? These are so awful. I can't remember his name. He's passed on. Wonderful, wonderful actor. He did Scooby and he's oh he's uh, like Don that. Messick, right? Don did Scooby. Yes, right. and Frank was in the Scooby series, and of course Frank did uh, Snorks with me, and we did the Spurs together. Mm-hmm. And, We've done uh, so many shows together. The Transformers together. He was in GI Joe. You know, he, but he, he, you know, he's marvelous talent. You know, you There's know, lots of animals. Michael, I had this con- I, I had the pleasure of talking to another great voice actor, James Arnold Taylor, who's on uh, the Clone Wars. And oh, I, I, sure, I, I love James. He's he's a good oh, guy. So, no, just no, no assumptions. He seems to have no ego. I don't know how it's possible. Just a dandy <laughs> guy. Yeah, he's a he's a really beautiful guy, and uh, we were talking about the uh, the Yogi Bear movie when it when it came out, and I said, you know, why is yeah. it that every time they bring an animated character to the big screen, they feel like they got to get big screen actors to do the voices, and, and and it drives me nuts because when I see you know commercials uh, on TV for the new Smurfs movie, I don't want to hear these people. I want to hear the original voices. They're still around. You're still yeah, around. That makes- that makes you and I, because, you know, I don't think Scooby-Doo did that well, quite frankly. I'm sorry, Yogi. I don't think Yogi Bear did Right, no, well. it didn't. And I think the Smurfs is going to take a real, it's going to take a nosebleed of a, of a dive, I think. Because uh, I, I just, you know, recently saw a friend who took his kids and he said, oh my God, he said, George Lopez is grouchy. Doesn't work. <laughs> I, I'll tell well, you what. I'll tell you what, Michael. My my daughter. She's going to be three in Sept uh, in September, and she watches an hour of Smurfs every Saturday and every Sunday with me oh, on on so Boomerang, crazy. and we we enjoy it to this day. And I I, I almost don't want to take her to the movie because <laughs> she's going to say that's yeah, not the Smurfs. <laughs> it's it's not the Smurfs. Katy Perry's lovely. I mean, you know, she's one, but she's not Smurfs. You know, no, Lucy Bliss. Lucy Bliss is still alive, and she can do it. Yeah, that's I've, the sad thing. She's still available. She can do it. Most of the guys are still around. Um, I don't think anybody's except for Don is taking the big uh, dirt nap. I think everybody else. And I know June Foray could still do Jokey, and certainly Oppenheimer is easy. He can do that puffy character that he played. That wonderful character he played. Who was the, the the great actor that did uh, Gargamel and a million other Hanna Barbera characters? That was Paul Winchell. Is he still around? No, Paul. Paul. Paul, Paul left the studio, but uh, when Paul was uh, doing Gargamel, and we all worked together, Paul, at one point around the last season, left. And they called me in because I used to joke. They used to have me uh, do a scratch track for him because he wasn't going to be in that day, and I would do a scratch track because I could imitate him. And uh, and they called me and they said, we want you to do Gargamel. And I said, you know, scratch track. They said, no, we want you to take over with Gargamel the last season. I said, what of the Paul? I said, well, you know, we're not really discussing. So I called Paul at home. And I said, uh, 
is this a money issue, Paul? He said, what do you mean? I said, because they want me to go to and you're not coming back. He said, no, I'm not coming back. I said, because if you're holding out some money, I'm not going to do it. I wouldn't step in if you're holding out. I mean, that's like a scab to me. He said, no, no, Michael. He said, I, I, I just pulled in, I don't know, several million dollars from a suit that I said it with NBC because they, they destroyed the tapes. I did my early tapes, years tapes of the show I did with uh, Paul Winchell and uh, Jerry Mahoney. And it wasn't theirs to destroy. So they had to pay me off. And I think it was like nine million or ten million. Or I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to get in my car and drive out to the studio for, for uh, you know, for some Jello. And I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do Jello. So I went in. And I said, sure. And I wound up doing the last. I think the last maybe five or six or seven shows with Gardner. Well, wow. I just, I just hope you guys, you know, know how uh, important you all are to us. And uh, you know, you provided a voice, like it was part of the soundtrack of my childhood and my life and i i really really do appreciate it and i know that there's a whole generation of kids that appreciate it there is and it's our pleasure i mean i really enjoy when i go to a convention i don't go to too many because it's 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 really so damn hectic (laughs) and uh uh it's just sort of maddening but but i've been to a couple and i think going to one in in uh, in england in next august for auto assembly for transformers so gij one of the two but, uh, but uh, when I go to them, I get so many people that come up, and they bring their kids because they introduce, they're introducing their kids to the old cartoons, which really amazes me because I thought kids would be somewhat, uh, um, what is the word I'm looking for, um, bored maybe by the, by the old cartoons because the new stuff is so amazing. And they said, no, the stories were great. The old stories were great. That was so wonderful. So I the voices. So I said, okay, I agree with you. I'll, I'll go along with that. No, it seems like some quality. of the popular cartoons these days are just so in your face and schizophrenic and, and rapid fire that that kids like to see stories that are maybe a little slower and maybe yeah. maybe are more character based and have a message. A lot of stuff I see on on Cartoon Network, etc. You know, it's it's a great station and everything, but a lot of the newer cartoons are just so insane. I I, <laughs> I don't I, sometimes I just don't get the humor. And and when you talk about an old cartoon like the Smurfs or the yeah. GI Joe or whatever, they're just a little more straightforward. There's a story, there's a start, a, a middle, and an end, and you get to know the characters and you hear the dialogue. It's just not a bunch of noise. Well, also, you know, they're trying to be very edgy now. Yes. And we never thought edgy. We always thought story. And we, at least at least producers then did, and the writers then thought story. And, then, you know, people would detect it. The story stunk. You know, you'd, you'd hear from the fans saying, that story really stunk. You guys are really reaching for that one. Or if it was good, they really loved it. But I've seen changes over the years, and uh, and it's I even gone into weakness and stuff, and I go, wow, that's... That's just not working. Hmm. I just, but listen, I'm I'm not the boss, so I'll I'll be fit. If I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. But it's nothing that I really crave to do. It's not as if it's a show I crave to do. You know, Michael, uh, 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 Jason brought up something before we started the show tonight. Kind of yeah. an interesting comment he made. With as much work as you were doing in the mid '80s. There was a Star Wars cartoon going on, the the Droids and Ewok series, and we were just wondering if you had any involvement, did any voices for that. I don't recall doing that. I don't think I did that. I know I did games. I know I did the Star Wars games, the video oh. games. I did played several characters in the Star Wars video games. That I know. Really? But, uh, I, I don't believe I ever did. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I I didn't I didn't realize, you know, as you say, you. you you do so much stuff and you jump from one thing to another and you don't know if it's going to come out or if it's ever going to be seen or if it's ever going to see the light of day. So you just don't think about those things. You just keep moving on. So, yeah. Uh, I see a I listing here for Star that. Wars uh, Force Commander from 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's one. And, and Michael, you also, and there's, we have a lot of crossover in our audience with uh, fans of Star Trek. And I mean, you did yeah. uh, some work on Deep Space Nine, um, some on-screen work. And you also, very prominent in the pilot for Star Trek The Next Generation, Encounter at Par- uh, Farpoint. What do you yeah. recall yeah, from... from exactly. What do you recall from that experience? Was What was the, the well, mood on I, set like? Did they think they had a hit or were they <laughs> not so yeah, sure? Nobody was... Nobody was thinking. I went in for the audition. Corey Allen, bless his heart, who's gone now, was the director. 
and he called me and he said, I, and you know, I'd known him years ago and we were friends, but, and he just didn't give me work. He said, I want you to read for this. You know, I can't give you anything, but I think you're right for this. If not, you know, we move. I said, no, sir, I don't hold you accountable for that. I do. I wanted much of a shot. I, said, I just want a shot. So he brought me in to do what uh, to read for, uh, Oh, the character of O in the pilot for uh, Star Trek. So I read for O, and then he looked at this other guy, this older gentleman, the old gentleman, and said, ask him to read Grappler's on. And I hadn't studied it. And he said, you want to take a few moments? And I said, sure, I took a few moments. And he said, okay, yeah, I, I can, let me read this. So I read Grappler's on, and I, I made him older, because he'd said he was old and creepy looking. And he said, just do your voice. I said, really? He said, yeah, they just look that way, but they're going to be of a certain age. I said, okay. So I did mine. He said, okay, well, yeah, I, I think that's what we want. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, I got it? He said, yeah. I said, I'm going to do this? And he said, yeah. I said, whoa, I finally made Star Wars. And then Gene said, well, this will be the second time we're working together. And I said, we are. And I said, he said, yeah. He said, I am Gene Roddenberry. I went, oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. Okay, but what did we do before? <laughs> Sorry. I don't recall doing another sci-fi with you. And he said, no, 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 you did a television pilot called him Then Came Bronson with Michael Parks, you are our guest star. And he said, and you remember what happened? I said, yeah, I do, and you're still going to hire me? And he said, of course. <laughs> I, I got into a fight with Michael and, uh, and Bonnie the Deer because I, I thought they were scumbags. So I got into a battle with him. So anyway, um, and I said, well, listen, I guess, I guess you know, I'm getting a second shot here. He said, no, you're right for this. So I did that when I got on the set. It was so exciting to be on that set because they always wanted to do uh, Star Trek as a youngster, you know, as, a, as an actor in the business. I always wanted to do it. I was always doing bad guys and heavies, and I just wanted to do a sci-fi. And I didn't get that opportunity until that. And I said, okay, this is great. Got on there and had a, you know, this really strange wig and clothes and all that good stuff. And met everybody and was friendly with everybody. Was, everybody was new, except for Patrick Stewart, who I absolutely adored, because I'm a big um, Masterpiece Theater fan. I'm a big Anglophile in my heart. Hmm. And I you know what a brilliant Shakespearean actor he was. It was such a treat to work with him and work with him. It was just really exciting. But something happened on the set that was very interesting. Uh, I, you know, I think, um, what's his name who played Data? Uh, Brent Spiner. Yeah. Brent, yeah, Brent kept complaining about the green paint. and said, oh, will you shut up? I'm crying out loud, this is going to be a hit. You're going to need a series for the rest of your life and probably can buy Sicily or <laughs> some small village in England. Shut up and just enjoy it. <laughs> he laughed and he said, well, it's just kind of so uncomfortable. I said, well, another actor would be thrilled with the uncomfortable. It's far more uncomfortable than the unemployment line, Brett. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> That's uncomfortable. So he said, no, 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 I know, I know. I'm just being a pain in the ass. But we did it and then uh, uh, I, and, I, and during the course of one scene, I get picked up by this creature and it has to be invisible. He's got me in his grasp. And, I'm, and he squeezed me, and I'm crying and yelling, and he drops me. And, you know, and it finally lets me down. So I have a friend of mine who is my size, he's a stuntman, and I called him, and I took it, I'd like him to be my stuntman. And he said, fine. And they put me up on God wires. And you know, on God wires, it's like a, kind of like a, we're kind of like a crotch thing <laughs> that's very tight around your nethers. <laughs> and it's really pulled tight. And I said, oh, this really hurts. And the guy, who's the guy who flies you, because he flies you, has to fly you, said, you know what, I had the same thing for Lucille Ball, and she never complained. I said, well, because her balls were bigger than mine, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> so they lifted me up, and as they were lifting me on the guide wires, and I'm, I'm flat out, I'm horizontal, and I'm being lifted up in these guide wires, and I'm thinking, oh, God, don't drop me. And the guy says, what are you worried about? This thing has got six million pounds per wire, whatever it is. So uh, um, the fellow that was uh, my uh, my uh, stuntman, uh, Roger Richmond, said, uh, "I want a I want a, uh, a a mattress under him." And they said, "No need." And he said, "I want a mattress under him." We're only lifting him about five or six feet, but he said he's flat. He's not going to land on his feet if it breaks. He's not going to break. He said, "I want a mattress under him." They thought, "Oh, what a pain!" Yeah. So they put a big mattress under me, and I was raised about maybe what I would say about eight, seven or eight feet up. And I'm, you know, twisting and turning and crying like a roll camera, and I'm twisting and turning. Oh, yeah. And you did this way. And all of a sudden, <laughs> boom, boom, I go down. Mm. And land on the mattress. <laughs> Thank and God for that mattress. And everybody stood there. I was, everybody's standing around. Nobody's moving. And I thought, mm, 
should I say my spine is broken? Should I say my <laughs> You'll, you'll get that 800000 no matter what. <laughs> no matter what. So I get it, oh, Al, and I said, okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. I said, I'll have this studio in the morning. <laughs> everybody looked at me. Everybody looked at me. Is you right? Yeah, fine. I said, are we talking series, future series, spinoff, Michael Bell stars in? You know, whatever you need. And everybody broke up, and it was fun, and we went on our way. And I thank Roger, and you know, we've been friends ever since, and I thank him. And I said, boy, boy, thank God I had somebody watching over me because I could have come down, and who knows? And you, you land flat like that on your back and the back of your neck mm. from eight feet on a, on a solid wood or cement floor. Yeah, you're, you're dead in the water. Jeez. I can't believe so they, were cons- a- they were th- – that was a consideration. <laughs> And, and, of course, the guy who was flying, he said, never happened before, never happened before. Oh, my God, I, I'm so sorry. I said, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, never happened before. Oh, my God. I said, it's okay. I'm not going to sue. Relax. It's okay. We're all good. So, uh, you know, Tita, I, I tested it. It's got the tensile strength. It, you know, it could, I said, it's not to worry. It happened. I'm just really thankful that, uh, that Roger uh, protected me on that. So that was, uh, that was my only hit. But I got to tell you, it was really interesting getting that set and walking around and... Um, I should have taken a piece of the set. It could have been an in de- It could have been probably my future. <laughs> a piece of that set, I could have sold it on eBay. Oh, even if you just had the wig, just the wig. Well, just they wouldn't let me keep anything. I mean, they checked on everything. I wanted to keep the socks and the strange necklace and the earring, but I did on Deep Space Nine. I kept my nose. Ah, there I got you go. my Bajoran ridge, ridge nose that I had. Do you still have it? It hasn't disintegrated yet. No, it hasn't, and I'm ready to sell it on eBay. All right, some money for my charity. I got a charity, and I'm ready to sell it. Not eBay. Um, Randall Nick, who's who's a, a super fan, is going to take photos of all your stuff. I got a lot of, I have a lot of um, memorabilia, you know, stuff that I've, I've gotten from stuff, um, cells from cartoon series, uh, um, items from Voltron, Defender of the Universe. Um, from the new Voltron. I got a lot of stuff that people had sent me over the period of time that some of the companies sent me. So I'm going to put them up for sale. But one of the things I have is my Star, Star Trek, my Star Trek uh, script. Mm-hmm. I've got that and the schedule, the shooting schedule, and I've got my, I got my nose. <laughs> I got my ridge nose. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Michael Bell, Hello. your contributions to pop culture are enormous. We certainly salute you for providing the voice of general willard in a new hope and uh oh yeah we're all very uh, and of course your uh, work on star wars uh force commander as well and and yes even your work on star trek so, <laughs> <laughs> but we really appreciate you taking the time to uh talk to us this week i i i don't think i really get, did the research that uh resulted in uh any names you were necessarily looking for try terry mcgovern though give him a shot i'm gonna give terry a call and i'm gonna tell you had you found that contract i would have given you ten percent ten percent oh jimmy might have worked a little harder <laughs> i'm might have worked a little harder you know, the guy who wrote uh, i ran into i was going doing a session and some guy said you know i'm connected i can probably go through those files i said really he said yeah and he, he was an actor who had written uh x-men so he wasn't acting anymore. And he said, I go out there all the time. I'm, you know, friends at the ranch. I'll, I'll go looking for you. And I thought, this is my savior. But he never got back to me. I think they killed him. I think Lucas had him killed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a pleasure talking to you guys. Oh, uh, likewise. Of be with you. Thank you and so much. Really a treat. Big fan. Thank, Thank you, so Michael. Much, Michael. Take care. You take care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. What a legend. The legendary Michael Bell. He had a lot of great stories to tell. Well, Jim, in, in that finder's fee, I wonder if it still applies, if you still keep this as an open, you know, do you have a, a, the X-Files, uh, you know, the Star Wars investigative report equivalent of the X-Files, you know, the the cold cases? Uh, is this a is this an investigative report cold case? Well, of course, it, it, this is going to stay open. This 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 file will stay open. Um, like the X-Files, I want to believe and I want to <laughs> believe in eighty thousand dollars. That's what I believe. You said ten percent. We all that's heard right. it. We yes, have we, it on tape. That's right. Ten <laughs> percent of eight hundred thousand is eighty thousand, and that could pay a few Jimmy Mac bills. Rebel!